just all of a sudden got very quiet. Welcome back, everybody. We are on to our last session for today, which is our lock note. Uh, so very shortly, I'm going to hand over to Chris Ferry. So Chris has a PhD uh, and does a lot of work in the science field. However, he also writes children's books. Now, I had an opportunity to see Chris speak at DDD Brisbane, a similar event on the other side of the country a few years ago, and I was actually super impressed with the books and thought it was really amazing. I got one of the books on blockchain, so now I know everything about blockchain from Blockchain for Babies. <laughs> and I also want to say a huge thank you to Chris, uh, who received an email from me on Wednesday morning to see if he could come and give our keynote this afternoon today. Uh, so big thank you to Chris uh, for saving us at the last minute when we had a few travel difficulties. So I'm going to hand over to Chris. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thanks for the invite. Thanks for giving me lots of time to consider it. Uh, <laughs> Um, I was going to be here for the tattoo conference anyway, so uh, I thought I might as well come by. Yeah, so uh, I'm Chris Ferry. I'm an associate professor at the um, Center for Quantum Software and Information at the University of Technology, Sydney, and that's obviously in Sydney. And I lead a research group, and we do research in uh, quantum machine learning and quantum control. So we do like uh, low-level stuff with quantum hardware and high-level kind of blue sky thinking. Um, about what we'll do with quantum computers in the future. But I thought, since I have you all here, um, I'll just read you a story. Uh, it's going to be a bit awkward for me to try to do this with the book, so I'll just show you the book on screen. I think I'll do that. Ah, here we go. OK, here we go. The cat in the box. It did not sit well. It was far too confusing. So we sat at the blackboard, the two of us musing. I sat with Schrodinger, dreaming of quantum theory, but the math of it all made both of us dreary. What was it about? We were not content. The trouble came down to the entanglement, and then a knock at the door, a box. But who was it for? We looked in and saw a cat in a box. We looked in and saw a cat that talks. And it said to us, get me out of this box. I was happy to see it, an extra mind. Right now, we needed all the help we could find. And then an idea. With the cat's great sight, it could see a single quantum, a quantum of light. An excited atom will decay, a random condition. The cat might see a superposition. Schrodinger went on. Next, we closed the lid. To look in the box is what I forbid. The cat will see and not see an odd condition. The cat will be in superposition. Schrodinger used this cat in the box to dream up the first quantum paradox. A paradox is something that doesn't make sense. There must be an assumption that is causing offense. The theory has failed, Schrodinger cried. We must start all over and swallow our pride. But then I smiled to our own merriment. We have the cat, box, and atom to do the experiment. The scientific method is to test hypotheses so our knowledge can grow beyond just the ABCs. Through all of this, shaking its head, the cat quietly listened to all that was said. A quantum superposition, the cat said with a sigh. A silly idea, and I'll tell you why, but I must teach you some physics and where it applies. The lesson began. I see your intent, but the most important thing is the measurement. When I look at the atom to see if it's spent, I create in the world a quantum event. When measurement acts, the atom itself is forced to collapse. It might stay excited, it might decay, but which it will be, no one can say. But all is not lost. We are not throwing dice. We can calculate some things when science gives us advice. Though nothing is certain, one thing is key. Physics can tell us the probability. Quantum probability, 
a tricky concept. To use it, one needs to be quite adept. But study the math, and before long, the quantum tune you'll be singing along. Algebra, calculus, and geometry, the more math you know, the happier you'll be. The cat was not done. There was more quantum physics. Such a rich theory can't be taught in mere minutes. The next lesson I have is where the name comes from. I'll tell you why we call it quantum. You see, said the cat, when you measure my size, any number at all is due to arise. But measure an atom and what will come out? A single quantum of energy will be brought about. A photon of light will be let go. The atom's energy from high to low. The photon's energy must be exact. One quantum of light from the atom subtract. So you see now, said the box cat, no superposition, no doubt about that. When I measure, I break the quantum effect, no paradox at all that you should suspect. I know all of this, Schrodinger quickly replied. I invented this theory, a fact none deny. I am afraid it is you who is missing a fact. The best part of the theory is due for its act. Of course I am talking of entanglement, the source that is giving me such bafflement. The box will be closed, just the atom and you. A large quantum thing becomes of the two. You and the atom, entanglement. A curious state, it's no accident. We'll open the box and ask just one question. What did it look like, the quantum connection? I wish to resolve this deep mystery so future scientists have less misery. The cat disagreed. It's not mysterious. You have simply mixed up our experience. Outside the box lies uncertainty, but for me in the box, I will know what I see. The light from the atom will come or will not and not superpose as you have thought. But the cat could see without doubt we were not ready to let it get out. So the cat agreed to stay in and wait for the atom inside to change its state. So the trial began, the atom and cat inside the box, it quietly sat. We waited too, the tension was rife. We decided to wait for the atom's half-life. That is the time for the atom's decay to reach the point of half what it may. The point of half-life was shown on the clock. Schrodinger knew what went on in the box. Two possibilities at the same time, but open the box and only one we shall find. But what had gone on before the box opened? From the cat in the box, it will be spoken. So we opened the box and what was in there? The cat sitting quietly, licking its hair. Cat, shouted Schrodinger, what do you say? What did you see? Do not delay. It is, as I said, I saw the photon. Nothing strange at all in the box has gone on. The atom collapsed a short time ago. I measured its light as it will now show. For science to work, repetition is key. To correct errors, we need at least three. But more is better. Data is gold, so valuable. It's bought and it's sold. So the cat went back in again and again. The cat was amused and did not complain. The results were in and we had to agree. There was no quantum magic for the cat to see. The light from the atom came or did not, but never them both, as Schrodinger thought. Now we are happy with no paradox, thanks to the cat, the cat in the box. The end. <laughs> Okay, so there was lots of words in there. Um, they upset Schrodinger. Uh, I don't know if you know who Sch Erwin Schrodinger is. He was a German scientist, Austrian scientist. I can't remember. At, back then, it didn't matter. Um, uh, but he, this is what he wrote. It's like this obscure paper that he became famous for. And this was, you know, this isn't exactly what he wrote because he wrote it in German. But this is the translation. So we can read that. So, one can even set up quite ridiculous cases. A cat is penned up in a steel chamber along with the following device, which must be secured against direct interference by the cat. In a Geiger counter, that is a thing that tests radioactivity, there's a little bit of radioactive substance, so small that perhaps in the course of an hour, one of the atoms decays, but also with equal probability, perhaps none. If it happens, the counter tube discharges and through a relay releases a hammer that shatters a small flask of hydrocyanic acid. If one has left this entire system to itself for an hour, one would say that the cat still lives if meanwhile no atom has decayed. But the first atomic decay would have poisoned it. 
the psi function, which I'll tell you about in a minute, of the entire system would express this by having in the living and dead cat mixed or smeared out in equal parts. Um, ah, this is like early 20th century Germany. Um, that's probably not oh, uncommon. Um, so I, I changed it for the modern times, so we have this cool cat that doesn't die. Um, but that, you know, that was one paragraph, and, and that's one of the most famous things that Schrodinger, uh, or the, it's the most, yeah, it's what he's most famous for. Although, he did invent the Schrodinger equation, which is still the equation that we use in quantum physics to explain the behavior of the microscopic world. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that because today, you know, at, this, at the Center for Quantum Software and places all around the world, we're trying to build a new kind of computing technology that's built from these things that, that Schrodinger is talking about. Um, and he was really frustrated about quantum theory. In fact, he left quantum theory to become an Irish botanist, um, which is also true. And he wrote a book called What is Life? And that became very influential to people like Francis Crick, who went on to discover um, DNA after he stole photos from someone. Um, so, it, you know, he's a, an, odd, an odd character. And I think had he stayed in quantum physics, he probably would have figured out some of the things that I'm going to tell you um, in a little bit. Okay, so what's all this stuff about atoms? So you've probably seen a picture like that. Maybe you remember it from your high school uh, chemistry or, or science class. You have this thing in the middle, and, and then the electrons go around the outside. And the further away they're away from the center, the more energy they have. So the lowest energy state is called the ground state, and the highest energy state is called the excited state. So there's two, imagine two states, ground state, excited state. If the electron goes from the excited state to the ground state, we call that decay. And when that happens, energy has to be given off. There's conservation of energy. If, if you have high energy, then low energy, then that energy has to go somewhere. And that energy is always the same amount. And that's where the word quantum in quantum physics comes from. And we usually associate things in quantum physics at the fundamental level with particles, and so it's a photon. Okay, so energy from the electron gets turned into electromagnetic energy that we can detect and see. Um, we'll move closer to abstraction. We'll get rid of this picture that we draw for, um, for students. And in science, we, we think of like a ladder of energy, and you can step up and step down, and you need to, 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 step, to drop down. You have to give away energy. That's the decay. But you can also have the opposite, which is absorption. And so for something to gain energy, to step up, then it has to accept a photon. And that amount of energy has to be e exact. OK, so the picture in the book was like this, you know, artistic between ground state and excited state. Um, you know, in, in in physics, we, we draw this energy level diagram. And um, since we're all comfortable with um, binary numbers here, let's label them 1 and 0. So you can see now that this atom can encode a bit of information in its energy levels. And it can do more than that. And how, what, the, the secret to quantum physics is to do this. You put little symbols around it. And now it becomes what Schrodinger called a psi function. And I'll, I'll tell you why we do that in a second. OK, so in the book, if the atom is excited, then it hasn't, give, it hasn't decayed and it hasn't given off this photon, so the cat can't see anything. Uh, if it decayed, then the cat sees the photon that was given off, and the, uh, uh, the electron is in the lower state. But what about in the middle? Hmm, that's interesting. Can we do that? Sure, why not? It's quantum physics. And we say that it's in a superposition. So it's in both 0 and 1 at the same time. 
And that's the sort of secret to, to quantum physics. So it's, even though I've labeled it zero and one, it, it doesn't encode a bit of information anymore. Um, technically, it's a new mathematical object. It's a vector. And if you know anything about vectors, then you can add them together. So in addition to zero and one, I can have any sort of combination of zero and one as well. So this is a new kind of information that is much richer than our conventional notion of bits. The rule is that either when you try to, when you try to go and look at this information, you'll see the lower state or the higher state. And what happens is determined by the rules of probability in quantum mechanics. Okay? Uh, but you never get to see superpositions. So that's the sort of trick. Um, so qu uh, quantum information is richer in some sense, but it's limiting in another sense. And trying to find the balance between those uh, is, is part of the, the trick of the quantum programmer. So the, the other thing that was mentioned in the book was these correlations. So I have the atom being in its lower state and the cat seeing, and I have the atom staying in its excited state and the cat not seeing. So those two events are correlated. And those correlated events can be put in superposition as well. Why not? They're vectors. Let's just add them together. And that's what's called quantum entanglement. It's a, coral, it's a superposition of these correlations. Uh, so Schrodinger, he was sitting outside the box, and that's what he had in his mind. Uh, OK, according to quantum mechanics, these things are correlated. And I have to describe them in this way. Uh, but I only ever see this or this. So what does that other thing mean? Right? What, what are these? What are these things inside this uh, angle bracket and straight bracket uh, bracket mean? Um, basically, his his question was, what is this psi function? So uh, when we when we write out arbitrary states of quantum information, we usually use Greek letters, and we start with psi, and then we run through them all until we're we run out and then we start putting subscripts and superscripts and all sorts of stuff that scares people away. Probably on purpose. Okay, so the answer to the question, there's two answers to the question. One is this object is in one-to-one -one correspondence with what's really happening. It's what describes reality. That's one way to look at it. If you follow that path, it'll lead you towards like Parallel universes, many worlds, the multiverse, um, Marvel movies, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of uh, philosophers and physicists like this. Um, but in the 90s, well, maybe like in the 80s, people started to think about this. What if this object is really just information? And if we think about it in that way, then we have this, we're not constrained by uh, our physical intuition that, that we require when we practice physics. And so in the, in the 80s, people started to think about what we could do with this information. It seems to be richer than bits. Um, could, we, could we just simulate it? So I saw a talk just, just earlier today where someone mentioned a, a Turing machine. Um, so there's the famous uh, Church Turing thesis that basically well, the physical version is a Turing computer can efficiently simulate any physical process in the universe. But that doesn't seem to be true of quantum physics. So it, in the 80s, they invented the notion of a quantum Turing machine. And there's a new thesis, the quantum Church Turing thesis, by the way, um, if you're ever get into quantum physics, it's just an exercise in putting the word quantum in front of everything that everyone else has already worked out. Um, it, the quantum church Turing thesis says that a universal quantum computer could efficiently simulate every, any physical process in the universe. And we don't know, we don't have an answer to that question of if there's a gap. 
Is a quantum computer actually more powerful than a classical computer? Um, you, you'll win a million dollars if you can answer that question. It's related to the famous P versus MP complete question. Um, but you probably win a lot more stuff if you figure that out. So we don't know, but we highly suspect that a quantum computer is, in some sense, more powerful than a classical computer. And in 1995, a guy named Peter Shore figured out that if you could build a quantum computer, there's an algorithm you can run on it, called Shor's algorithm now. Um, I don't think he called it Shor's algorithm, but people after him called it Shor's algorithm. Um, that would crack RSA. And so 1995 was really the cusp when people started to get interested in this because there was money and people tend to follow money. And we didn't have any, any device at the time. Now we have many commercial available quantum computers. So at the University of Perth, I think the only commercially available quantum computer uh, in Australia, it runs on two quantum bits called qubits, so not very impressive. And the largest device um, is around 150 quantum bits, also called qubits. And you can access that for free over the cloud, um, or you can pay. And those devices have been sold to governments ar around the world as well. So the, the, we've seen slow progress, but in some sense, that's the kind of progress you want to see for new technology. You don't want to see stuff like Web3 or blockchain or whatever, where it's just hype and then disappears. Uh, this is really new transformative technology um, that requires um, a, a slow pace because it's very difficult. Um, so it's going to require a, a lot of effort. And, and now is really the time when I think uh, people like you in the audience might consider getting involved because there are devices available and they're currently being programmed by physicists. And if you've ever seen physicist code, <laughs> you can see that this is gonna lead to a huge disaster. Um, there's, there's a thriving open source uh, community in quantum development. Um, a few of my colleagues live stream on Twitch quantum development. Um, so it's definitely something that's, that's happening now and you can get in early um, and, and into this new, nascent, exciting field. Um, so that's all I wanted to tell you today and I'm happy to take any, any questions uh, about quantum technology or children's books. <laughs> Thank you. I think there's some microphones, uh, yeah. There's one up, way up there, <laughs> the furthest away. <laughs> Go over there next. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much, that was a great talk. Um, if you ha do you have any recommendations on where to get started with quantum development, how to get involved in the community, anything like that? Because it does sound interesting. Yeah, so I, 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 I would suggest starting with um, there's, there's this non-for-profit called the Unitary Fund, and it's, a, it's probably the largest open source quantum community. So if you look up Unitary Fund, um, and they, they'll give small grants and stuff to people who are interested in, in you know, adding, uh, you know, adding small components to existing open source projects. Yeah. And, and I'll, I would say the majority of people don't have a background. They're, like, they're not PhD quantum physicists in that community. Like, they're people coming from outside of, of, the, of the more traditional quantum computing community. So it's, it's a very welcoming, a very welcoming community. Any other questions? I think there's one down here. How many qubits are we looking at before RSA becomes completely useless? Um, 
Millions? Okay. Yeah, it depends on, so the problem today is that qubits are very fragile. So a, a bit, um, you know, a, a transistor has an error like one in a billion, right? Um, so, but if now that you have a billion in your device, they happen quite often. So active error correction is, is important, but it's far more important for, for qubits. Uh, we're, we're not at the stage where we, we have error corrected qubits. We don't have perfectly operating devices. The better we make the physical qubits, the fewer we need, like the less overhead we need, the less redundancy we need. So the estimates now are a million, but it, it could, be, could be less. And so it's like that's the worst case scenario. And if you look at the trend, it looks, it looks to be like a Moore's law of qubits. That's maybe 30 to 50 years from now. Um, so the US government, for example, has moved to post-quantum cryptography already because they have 30-year secrets, probably. Um, so if you have a, a secret you need to keep for 30 years, then maybe it's, maybe it's time to, to think about post-quantum cryptography. Yeah. I have 30-year-old secrets. <laughs> Is there a question up here? Oh, over here, sorry. In your opinion, did Google truly achieve quantum supremacy? Uh, yeah, so there's this idea that um, there's nothing a quantum computer can do today that my mobile phone can't do. As, but as quantum computers get bigger, every time you add a qubit, uh, the complexity doubles, so it grows exponentially. So at some point, quantum technology will overtake conventional digital technology. Uh, and Google claimed to had, had done that probably three or four years ago at this point. But it's, it's not something that's easy to prove, right? Um, and I think with hindsight, we would say no, that, that isn't the case because people have improved upon existing ways to simulate quantum computers that can easily replicate what Google did on their devices. So it's a sort of, at the moment, we're at this sort of cusp where uh, uh, in increasing the capacity of quantum technology provides a challenge for conventional technology that m may easily, may be easy to overcome because, you know, this isn't something that people think about all the time, so not a lot of effort has been put into uh, simulating circuits that are built of superconductors, for example. But you know, when smart people go and, and try to figure it out, it, it turns out that it can be done. But eventually, it'll just be impossible. There will be, if you think about it this way, if you could build a device with 300 qubits, then the number of possible states in that superposition that I showed you would be more than the number of particles in the universe. So we won't be able to do it with, with bits of information at some point. Where that point is, I, I don't know. It's, you know it, it could be now. It, it could have been two years ago. With, but yeah. I'll also point out that w they're just trying to demonstrate that their device can do something that conventional technology can't simulate. Like, I can't use a conventional computer to simulate what that device did. That, that thing that the device that did was, wasn't useful for anything other than to demonstrate that one thing. So um, it's not like it was solving actual real-world problems or anything. We're not, we're not there yet. That's going to require thousands to millions of qubits. Any other questions? No. Hi. Oh, uh, we need a microphone. There's one coming from behind you. Oh. Hi. <laughs> no. That's okay. So, Next can a quantum a... quantum computer handle memory leakages? Sorry, can you say it again? Can a quantum computer handle memory leakages? Like we face a lot of memory leakage issues in classical computers. So, can a quantum computer handle that? Um, so, a quanta, so a, 
there are, there's, a, there's a website, it's called the Quantum Algorithm Zoo, and it has a, a couple dozen problems that uh, quantum, uh, quantum algorithms exist for that are better than known classical algorithms. But standard things like representing data, adding numbers, things like that, the, the overhead actually makes it worse. So a quantum computer won't be better than a classical computer at everything. There are a few special problems for which that kind of new data is a more natural or better representation. Yeah. Thank you. I think it was up here. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. That was really fascinating. Um, so I have a question. Uh, realistically, in the future, how do you see quantum computers are being used? Will they replace all traditional alternatives that we use now? And if so, what, what are the top three problems that humanity needs to solve in order to achieve that? Thank you. Right. So I think the way that it will progress is, um, first we'll see a cloud cloud-based devices, because there, be, there will be a very few of them. Uh, and they also require, it, it, if we don't make, uh, you know, basically Nobel Prize winning improvements in materials, these things re require extreme environments. So ultra high vacuum, like fewer, fewer particles than you would find in outer space, or cools with liquid helium, which makes these these sort of refrigerators that they're housed in the coldest places in the universe. Um, you, don't, you don't want your average consumer, I think, to have to handle that. Um, so there'll be cloud-based devices initially. Uh, but even if we end up finding a way to miniaturize it and make it work at room temperature, there'll still be special purpose components. It'll be like, you know, you have your GPU and maybe you have your TPU and you'll have your QPU all, you know, handled by, a, you know, your existing computer, your existing CPU will just outsource particular calculations that it knows will be more efficiently run on the quantum processor. Oh, and you had the other question. So I don't think it'll ever be used to break RSA because we'll move beyond, uh, we'll move beyond that. Uh, the most promising application is using quantum systems to simulate other quantum systems. So right now, it's very difficult to simulate chemical interactions, just because, again, as I said, you know, a chemical might have more than 300 atoms in it, and so the number of states it can be in is more than the number of particles in the universe. So conventional technology has a real hard time representing that rich data with bits. And so when you're designing vaccines and drugs and stuff, you're, you can do some heuristic things and you can do really coarse grain simulations, but ultimately you have to make a guess, build the drug, stick it in mice, find out what happens, right? In the future, if we're able to simulate the interaction between biological models in a virtual environment, then that will just, that will be truly transformational. We'll be able to design new drugs, new vac vaccines, new materials, all in a virtual environment before we have to go out and spend the money to, to build the, the actual thing. So I think that'll be the number one, uh, yeah, the number one application. Where's the microphone I can't see? Oh, here. <laughs> Um, how come you didn't say study physics as a prerequisite to getting into quantum computing? So, um, as in quantum mechanics, so study, uh, have a physics, yeah. physics background, have a physics degree. It's like studying computer science to do programming, etc. So, uh, fundamentals. I think, I mean, that's a, just a historical quirk that the people who invented the field were physicists, and so the language and jargon is all physics jargon, but that's changing. So at the University of Technology, Sydney, you can get a Bachelor of Computer Science and major 
in quantum computation. So I teach introduction to quantum computation to people who've never taken a physics course at all. There's no physics jargon in it. And we start with programming. We build a quantum tic-tac-toe game, and we run it on a quantum computer. And they don't need to. I, mean, I could do it without even using the word superposition and entanglement. You know, once you just specify the rules and the grammar and the syntax of the quantum programming language, then it's just like any other computer science. Did the microphone move up? Hi, come oh. up here. Yeah. Hello. Um, so Schrodinger's cat represented an era of quantum computing um, where we had leaps and bounds in discovery and understanding, but that was like the 20s, like 1920s and 1930s. What do you think is next? for quantum theory, like the next big thing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so the, you know, the questions that Schrodinger raised are unresolved. Um, you know, we don't, we don't really know what the nature of reality is. We know that quantum mechanics is wrong in some sense. We have two main theories in physics, Einstein's theory of general relativity, which works for large scale things, and quantum mechanics, which works for small scale things, and they're completely incompatible. So one of them's wrong, or they're both wrong, which is the more likely scenario, uh, and that's kind of what most theoretical physicists think about, at least the ones that um, have tenure. They, <laughs> <laughs> they, they think about, how do you bring these two things together? You know, it's what Einstein spent the mo most of his life trying to figure out. He, I mean, he kind of invented both of the theories um, and then spent the rest of his life trying to put them together. Uh, so doing that or coming up with a completely new theory that supersedes both general relativity and quantum mechanics. And you can get some pretty wild speculations like the universe is a hologram um, uh, or, you know, a black hole is really a quantum computer. These sorts of things uh, are what people talk about at theoretical physics conferences. Um, I, I, yeah, um, I guess I'm not old and cranky enough to think about that sort of stuff. I still write, re I just write research grants in children's books. <laughs> Any other questions? There's one down here. Oh, uh, and there's one over there. <laughs> uh, thanks for your talk. I was going to change tack and talk about your, um, you know, being an author for children. Can you describe uh, a bit of your creative process from being a scientist to then communicating what are quite you know, obscure or perhaps esoteric uh, concepts to such a junior audience? I mean, what do you, how do you even start that process? Yeah, so I think the motivation obviously was to, for my, to read to my own kids. So I have four children and I wanted to read science books to them. And this was maybe eight years ago. It didn't really exist. So I thought, well, I'll just try to do it myself, and, and what better thing to write about for children than quantum physics? And so I wrote, <laughs> <laughs> I wrote Quantum Physics for Babies, and, um, and I, I kind of approached it as I would my, my own sort of teaching. So I don't really <laughs> distinguish between an, an audience of physicists and an audience of children. Um, you know, just... <laughs> <laughs> Keep it simple and use bright diagrams. <laughs> um, yeah, and so I did that, and it, it seemed to work out. And, and some of the other, like the, the book here was kind of modeled um, loosely on, uh, um, you know, the, the, cat, the cat in the hat, um, although the, this isn't going to go live. Is it live? Oh, it is live. Uh, <laughs> So if the Dr. Seuss Foundation is listening, you didn't hear that part. Um, so I, you know, as a physicist or as a scientist, you, you're just naturally attuned to taking things that people have built and, 
and simplifying them or looking at them in a different way or building upon them, um, usually to make them better. Now, I don't want to say that I made something better than Dr. Seuss, but the, the point is it's much easier to take something that exists and then put your own spin or Im improvement upon it. And that's kind of what scientists do all the time. Nobody just invents a theory in vacuum, right? They, they build upon the previous thing. It's all incremental. And so for me, it seems really like it's just a natural thing for me to do to say, take something that exists and I know that works well, and then add my own flavor to it. Can I? Um, so like we see like say AI, AI in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of like debates about ethics, ethical cool problems and the such. Is there anything, any um, debates of that sort in the quantum world? It is, it's very, uh, there's not a lot of people thinking about it. Um, so yeah, I think there was a white paper about, about quantum ethics. Um, and you know, it's largely inspired by the debate in AI. Uh, the argument is let's get on top of this now or we're gonna end up like AI with a whole bunch of things to fix in the future. Um, but, you know, without, I, th I think it, you, really you can, you, we're watching an experiment, right? And the a hypothesis is, does money talk? And y yes, it does. So there's no money being put into that effort. And there's money being put into just going and moving forward as fast as possible. Um, so it's, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, I, my suspicion is like most things are just, we're going to forge ahead with a lot of stuff to clean up afterward. But there, there is, there is. So one of the one of the differences is that the promise of quantum technology and the likely path forward is that at some point in the future there'll be only a handful of these devices, and they'll be extremely powerful, like they can break RSA. So. Uh, there won't be democratic access to these these things um, be because of the way things are structured, and so that that that's sort of the the, the major difference um, in the debate between like quantum ethics and AI ethics. But it's certainly so, something that people think about. It's just not enough. Any more questions? See one. Just kind of following up from that, uh, the, the, what you're just talking about. Um, so, what does a career like look like in quantum computing for, let's say, a student going through one of your classes right now? What is the? Uh, let's just say they're in their twenties and they're going to spend an entire career. What do you? Look, what do you think it would look like? Yeah. So, the quantum industry is large enough at this point that the majority of people that are in it. Um, don't really know anything about quantum computing at all. So, you know, a quantum computing company, so I would say a quantum startup company needs to have a website. So it needs web designers, right? Uh, and I, I work closely with a couple quantum startups and you need remarkably little knowledge about quantum computing. To, if you have, if you're a talented developer, then you can learn all, all you need to know on the, on the job. Um, in, so in our degree program, there's kind of two pathways. There's sort of the honors um, higher education pathway. So if you want to be like a research scientist at a quantum company, then you still need a, some, some higher degree, probably a PhD. Um, but then there's sort of the technology pathway where you will be a computer scientist, but the quantum company won't have to spend eight months uh, on some special induction about, about quantum computing for you. So you'll already be kind of well-versed in all of the language and lingo and nuances that you would otherwise have to learn on the job. But I, I speak to people who work at quantum startup companies, and they're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know any, I don't know what, 
Like I, 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 someone told me to program this thing and I did it, but I have no idea what it means. Oh, <laughs> oh. yeah. Probably like devs, have you seen devs? Yeah, if you haven't, yeah. Devs is probably, the, if you really want to figure out what a quantum st startup is like, watch the, I think it's on uh, FX in, in, in the US and then it's, I don't remember what, what streaming service is on here, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a series uh, about a quantum computing startup company. <laughs> All right, thank All you right. very much, Chris. Thank you again for joining us today.